So we are in um, chapter 16. We're going to be looking at kind of a fun topic. Uh, this concerns forms, and we're going to be looking at several things today for forms. Uh, we'll be looking at um, the modern HTML5 improvements to forms, uh, how you create them, processing form data, uh, organizing form elements, creating text boxes, labeling your form parts, uh, creating password boxes, creating email, search, telephone, URL boxes, creating radio buttons and uh, check boxes and creating text areas and creating select boxes. As you can tell, we have a lot to cover. <laughs> Allowing visitors to upload files as well. Uh, creating hidden fields and how to create the submit button as well as hiding or disabling form elements you've probably seen that before and styling forms based on their state whether it's submitted or not so we have quite a bit to cover and there's a lot here um, one of the problems though that we're going to face today in doing this is we haven't necessarily set up your w3 hosting uh, site your 000 hosting site uh, with PHP and if you guys want to take the opportunity and do some of that you can there is a sample PHP text um, processing script that you can upload and practice and see how forms work okay so really when you're talk, when we're talking about forms, we're looking at two parts. We're looking at the form control objects, which really are what you see here. Um, the names, the, the drop downs, the dates, uh, radio buttons and forth, so forth. And we're also looking at the processing script. The processing script is what this form points at. So it's going to point at some type of server side processing script, and that will take the data and do something with it, whether it be to enter it into a database or store it somewhere or send out an email or whatnot. Um, your forms, they consist, of course, of your input elements, your drop down or selects, your labels, and your buttons. And this form as well considers some other things, like it has an H1 that you can see here. Um, there's also additional labels down here. I believe these are the um, uh, paragraph labels and so forth. But there's there's a lot that you can put on a form. Um, and of course, if you have a form on your page, you want to make sure that your users, your visitors are filling it out appropriately and that all, all parts of your form are activated appropriately. Okay, um, your form processing scripts. So this site, this page is basically considering your form controls, but your processing scripts, these take the information and confirm, uh, convert it into a format that you can read or tally. Typically, this is found in the form of an, of the action, uh, excuse me, an attribute key value pair, pair called action and script. So you can see right here, there is a form tag we have the action attribute and it points to a URL. Um, these can be JavaScript that, that are called on the server side, uh, but typically there is a URL out there that you need to use. Now, I'm gonna copy, oops, I'm gonna open up this site here for you. And I'm gonna paste this into your chat. Um, <clears throat> And you guys go ahead and go to that site while we're on there, so we're on it together. Um, this site that we're looking at, this is related to the textbook. We're at chapter 16, and there is a form HTML. So if you click on the form HTML, you're going to see what the standard form looks like. You could fill it out and, and so forth. And hit create an account and this will process um, a particular piece of data all right so 
the actual display, I believe it is down, let's see, is it this one? Yes. Uh, this show data dot text is basically the HTML, but it's written out as a TXT. And in it, down at the bottom, you're going to see the actual PHP script. This is the PHP script here. Now you can take this script, just this, well, let's see, all the way down to here. So you got to go from the uh, less than question mark PHP all the way down to the, uh, the other PHP field here. And of course you can display this uh, like so. You can take, um, they're cutting it off here, but you could type PHP question mark and all of this text. And um, what's going to happen is when the form, let's go back and look at the form HTML. When you submit the form, I'm going to inspect this to show you. When you look at the form, it's going to call show data PHP. So that show data text, you just we basically copy that the whole file and change it to show data PHP and upload it to your triple zero web host account. And then you could point your form submission at that. And when you click the form submission, it would spit back out the data. OK, so keep in mind this site. This relates to chapter 16 forms, and there's some good examples in here. Um, there's also examples down here that relate to later parts of your text on disabling HTML. So you can see here it's disabled. Click on something, it's undisabled, right? Uh, there's also sample code in here for the toggle script that's used for the disable. Uh, just keep in mind, excuse me, keep in mind this site. Okay, let's go ahead and go back to our, uh, our text here. So what we have here, the HTML5 form elements, they have um, Um, was it Martin who told me that Clayton is out? Who was it that told me that? Okay, Martin, if you could keep an eye out for him when he comes in, uh, because it's hard for me to see with my... Or maybe send him an email and let him communicate with you to let me know to let him in. Thank you. Um, so the HTML5 form elements, they're different than previous. Many of these features didn't exist prior to HTML5, and the only way you could do some of this validation was through JavaScript, as well as the form elements themselves. Um, if you wanted to submit an email, you basically just put type text up here, and or a search would be type text, telephone type text, so forth, right? And then you'd use JavaScript or CSS to validate it, and um, and then on the back end on your server, you would also validate the text. But with HTML5, you actually now have these input types of email, search, telephone, and URL. And these really simplify it, as well as these other uh, browser uh, types, browser limited types of date, number, and range. And as far as the date, uh, I'm not sure why. Uh, a lot of the browsers haven't supported yet all of the, the different types of dates because you have date, date time, date with a minute, date with second. Uh, there's a lot of um, different variations there. And all of the web developers or Java web developers will be rejoicing when they finally come up with a standard because we don't, wouldn't have to use these other JavaScript libraries. Now, uh, jQuery and jQuery UI um, 
I'll go ahead and type that into the chat window. These are some JavaScript libraries that are very uh, useful. Um, jQuery UI is a set of user interfaces that literally uses JavaScript and it creates these, um, these elements on the page, styles them a certain way so that the data you click on, it channels it out to look like uh, either a, a date time picker or um, there's a lot of different examples. But these two libraries are very useful, as well as a new set of libraries that's arisen. This is called the Bootstrap. And I, did, I didn't want to show you all the Bootstrap because if you saw Bootstrap, you may go, oh, well, why am I doing all this hard work of learning? Because you need to learn it. <laughs> um, Bootstrap is a great CSS and JavaScript library with it that offers a bunch of other components. All right, for your project, though, do not use Bootstrap. Okay, do not use it. Make sure you do everything by hand. All right, we'll go on from there. Uh, you have other items like a data list, which is uh, it's a pretty cool feature. You have color pickers. So you can type, put color in there, and you click on it, and it'll drop down a color chooser for you. So you can actually choose a, a different colors that we've been looking at. Uh, of course, these are the other ones that have limited support, the date, time, date, time, local, month, time, week, and so forth. And then you also have this output text, and we're not really going to worry about that one too much right now. Okay, so the attributes themselves, HTML5 really improved, um, allow for some great improvements for these attributes. These are accept, which will limit the type of... Um, type of files that you can upload. Um, maybe you only want to upload uh, JPEGs or PDFs or Word documents. You can set the accept attribute and control what type is uploaded. Uh, autocomplete, this is another very useful one. Uh, many times you've probably been on sites, you type in text and automatically the browser starts giving you options based on things that you've typed in previously. You can set autocomplete to off and it'll stop that functionality. Um, it's all up to you. It's really up to the, the user scenario, what you're trying to accomplish. The default is on for most of these, as you've, as you've seen. Uh, autofocus. Autofocus basically says when a new page opens, I want this text field to be the focus immediately where cursor input will occur. So um, that's nice because you don't have to move your mouse around and click on the field. It will automatically set that for your user. Uh, the multiple attribute. Multiple is very useful, uh, especially if you have multiple files to upload. But multiple is also useful for things like email, uh, search, telephone, and URL boxes. The key here for multiple is in the input box, make sure you separate your emails by comma or your search parameters by commas. It'll take that as a comma delimited list and it'll use that for uh, the, the processing. Uh, you have list, which is a link to a data list and an input. You have max length. Max length specifies the maximum number of characters in a particular text area. And it has been supported. Let's see, here's Clayton now. There we go. Uh, it has been supported in, um, in other browsers before HTML5, but kind of keep a lookout because it is a little spotty in some places. Uh, when we get to pattern, pattern refers to the, the format of the text that you're going to accept. The very common pattern that we use is regular expression, regular expression. And when you look at regular expression, it's probably gonna blow your mind, but there's a lot of uh, uh, freebies out there uh, free regular expression scripts already written. And believe me, when you look at regular expression, it looks like gobbledygook, and you're going to go, well, I don't know what this says, because it's not English standard uh, readable. It's literally, uh, it's text parsing language is what it's based on. But it's very powerful for determining validation of input text. You also have the placeholder. Placeholder specifies the hint of what 
information should be in there. So sometimes you've seen it. You'll see uh, a text that says first name in the label, and in the label it says please enter your first name. As soon as you click on it, the text disappears. This is called the placeholder text. And before, when we wanted to do that type of functionality, we had JavaScript that would do that. And you could still write JavaScript libraries to do that, but really placeholder makes that just, you can get rid of it now. And it's faster using it this way. Required means that in order for the form to submit that field, if it's marked required, they have to fill it out. Form submission won't, won't pass. Um, then you also have form no validate and no validate. So form no validate turns off browser HTML5 automatic validation features. This is uh, typically seen on the element themselves. Um, no validate is something you usually put on the form. So form validate you put on the element no validate you put on the form. And we'll, we'll show some examples of that in a little bit. Uh, what I wanna do though, I want you to click on this site. This is called wufu.com, HTML5. I'll post this in the chat again for everyone. Wufu.com. Um, Wufu has a great list of uh, things that you can use to look at what is actually supported for the different browsers. So for example, you see email, you see telephone, URL, search. Color is not supported by mobile Safari, nor by IE 11, it looks like. Uh, it is supported by Edge, just to let you know. Um, date is not supported by Firefox or Safari, right? And then uh, these are the other ones that are there. You also have browser support for the attributes. So this is a good list to look at to determine um, what attributes are supported, what elements are supported, and so forth. I recommend you spend time going through this, especially when you're creating your sites. Uh, if you're working for a company, you need to make sure it passes on the majority of your sites. If it doesn't, Typically what, what we do is you have a fell over. You fell over with JavaScript or you fell over with some other UI library or you just tell them, hey, this site is not designed for mobile or it's not designed for Opera, right? You wanna be upfront about that. But in general, everybody has a different device uh, and a different browser they're using. So you wanna try to support every browser you can and that means that you have to control what types of elements. And that means that, again, that makes you think about how do I accomplish the functionality I need to get across in my application if I need to support Internet Explorer 9 or 8 or Safari, right? Um, you need to, need to think through those things. Anyways, this site has a lot of great uh, support. There's other elements in here like meter, progress, output, Key gen, data list, option, label. Um, it talks about your JavaScript, testing support, validation messages. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in here. I, re I really recommend you take some time to look at wufu.com HTML5. Okay, so back to your forms. Each form is going to be wrapped in an opening and closing form tags. These represent the parent objects. And inside your form, you will have the input type or the, the control or the field. Now, your books, as well as, as myself, uh, will often use control or field uh, interchangeably. So whatever the controls are, these typically go in a form. The other things I want you to pay attention to here are the name attributes the action attributes, and the method attribute. Notice that the form has a method, and this could be either get or post. It will not be both. I'm listing both up here because this is typically the most common, get or post. But it, will, it has to be one or the other, okay? Get or post. And the action is gonna be a URL that points to where the server-side script 
is going to process the data that's being submitted inside the form. The other important piece of information here is that your input uh, control or in input field must have a name attribute. The name attribute is required if you're going to submit data. Data is submitted in key value pair. And so the key is the full name and the value is what is inputted into the text. Um, so later on, we'll look at some examples of a get post and a get, excuse me, a get submission. And get will use, it will post, it will put the, um, the data and key value pair in the URL at the top. We call that a query string. Post will not do that. Post submits it behind the scenes and it makes it more, more hidden. Okay, any questions so far? Any questions? Anytime you're gonna be doing data processing with your site, you have to use a form, okay? It, it's just, um, and, and you want to use forms. You wanna capture user data. You wanna be able to take the data and make your site more interactive. Maybe it's a blog posting or maybe it's a, some type of chat log. This is where you would use your forms to, sum, to submit things. All right, here we have a simple sample of code. Notice again, we're using form. The method here is post and the action is pointed at show data PHP. We're wrapping this code here inside of a field set. Field sets are not required, but they're recommended because they provide natural groupings. Inside the field set, I have an H2, a header, with a class called HDR account, and inside of it I have the account name. Underneath that, I'm wrapping all of those elements inside of a div. And this div, I, I give a class with the name of fields. And inside of my div, I have two paragraphs. And the paragraphs, remember they provide that um, new line breaks in between, that nice grouping. And so the first paragraph has a class of row, and the second one has a class of row. And inside of it, we have a label, and the label has a for attribute that says first name. And then we put in our text first name. And we have an input type of text with an ID of first name. And what I want you to notice here are three things. First of all, notice that the label for says first dash name and the ID second has first dash name. The for attribute always points at the ID of something on the page that has this, this attribute, this, this value. Hence why it's important that your IDs typically are only used once on the page. Because if you have a label that's, that's set for first name, there only needs to be one other item on the field with that ID called first name, right? What would happen is on your page, if you clicked on the label and the label had the four attribute pointing at the ID, when you click on that, it would automatically set the focus of your text input inside of the input text. So you click on the label, the cursor will automatically jump inside of the input. That's what the label for does for you. The other, the third thing I wanted you to notice though is the name field. Notice here, name is different than the ID. Typically, we want to make sure that we keep our IDs with dashes and our data objects with underscores. Our IDs with dashes, our data objects with underscores. Okay? Same thing with our classes. Our classes will be, will be with dashes. But any data attribute, which your name field, your name attribute will be a data attribute. Okay? These always need to have underscores. All right. Does everyone understand that? This is pretty important right here. If you don't, you'll be scratching your head later why your data doesn't show through if you don't, if you don't do this right.
Okay. Down on the next one, it pretty much replicates the same thing. So for last dash name, the ID it matches. We have the type is text, and we have the name is underscore, last underscore name. And then down at the bottom, we have to provide a submit button. Here, the type is submit, and the value is create account, and then we provide a class called button, BTN. Now, input type submit, if you do not provide a value, the default name will be submit on the button. However, if you provide a value for your button, which is type submit, the value will be what you provide, or the, the text label will be what you provide. Now there's another way we can do a submit button as well, but we'll get into that a little bit later. So the data attributes which are important here are the form method, okay, the form action, the input name, and the input type. These four will allow you to submit the data on the page. So when I click submit, it'll wrap up, it, it serializes this data, and it sends it to this URL. That's how these, this form works. Any questions? You guys are awake? Okay. Let's talk about form validation. So look at the difference between this section here and this section of code. What do you all see? What is the primary difference? Yeah, no validate. Now, in HTML, you don't necessarily have to include no validate equals no validate. Specifying the attribute alone automatically means that you're not going to validate it. However, if you're using uh, XHTML as your doc type, XHTML will require that you have opening and closing tags and that all of your data attributes follow the key value pair. In standard HTML, you don't have to do that. So no validate is the key here. Uh, when we say no validate, it basically means that on this form, we're not going to validate anything that happens, right? This disables, really, your form validation. So let's talk a little bit more about the form details, like the method. There are a set of um, HTTP protocols, and they have these method types. And there are much more than just post or get. There's quite a few. Um, we'll look at some of those in a moment. But these are the two that you really need to be thinking about. So using the post, remember this for your test, by the way. Using the post will not display the form elements in the query string, in the URL. Using get as your form method will display the form elements in the query string, okay? Get is for getting information from the server. That's what you want to use a get for. And post is for putting information on the server. Um, as a general rule, when in doubt about the type of, type of thing you're doing with your data, use a post. Okay, post the data because it isn't exposed in the URL. All right, think about reasons we might do that. Say that you're asking for credit card information. Do we want the credit card information up there in the query string? No, no. Especially say if you're at a, um, you know, you're at a uh, coffee shop, and there's all these free computers and everyone's logging in or you're at the library and you're using the free computers. And you get up after doing some searching on the web and some nefarious person comes in behind you and starts clicking the back button to see what your URL posting is, to get information from you. We wouldn't want to put credit card up there. 
right? We wouldn't want to put any type of PII data, like your date of birth or where you're born, social security number, things like that, right? We want to make sure we keep all that information secret. Okay, so your form details, action, and the HTTP methods. Um, your form action attribute, this is where you're going to call the server, that server URL, whatever's in the action attribute, to get the information or post the information. Now, I talked about this a minute ago. There's other form methods that you can use. There is options, there's put, there's head, there's delete, there's trace, and connect. Um, in my, uh, one of my previous jobs, we worked a lot with microservices. And microservices is, um, it's one of those topics that's very, very popular right now in the software development world. And with the service, the microservice, it's very important that the type of thing you're doing use the appropriate HTTP method. So for example, if you were going to add some new information, you'd use a put. If you're going to say we're going to delete information, you'd use a delete. If you're going to get a little bit of information, you use a get or a post, right? These are the common ones you would use. Now, options, trace, and connect, I don't ever use, and I really don't know a lot about them. Uh, I can tell you that the majority of the web does not use trace, connect, or options. But put, get, post, delete, they're used quite a bit. Uh, same thing with head. I don't know. All right. At this point, you don't have to be too concerned with these but you do need to be concerned with post or get, okay? Post or get. The important thing with these attributes, these, these methods are read by the server script, and they're going to interpret the data that's given via whether it's a put, a post, a get, or any of these others. Okay. Types of form actions, how they can be done. Well, you can write these uh, server-side uh, scripts in Java. You can write them in PHP, which we've posted a couple of uh, samples on uh, the HTML, CSS, VQS.com site, uh, the scripts for this uh, class, for the chapters. Uh, they can also be written in C++, in C Sharp, in Perl, and there is a long list. Um, there's even JavaScript servers called Node.js, and you can actually write those as well there. Now, all of these servers, they listen on a port for the HTTP method request, and they interpret them, and they send back an HTTP response code. The types of response codes you typically want to look for are 200 means success, 404 means not found. 403 means security issue, they're not permitted. 500 means there's a server side error. Those are typically the ones that you wanna keep in mind looking for. Um, in general, you can run all of these, these uh, server side scripts on web servers like Apache, Tomcat. You can even run it on the Microsoft IIS and there's even more that are out there. Uh, by the way, the triple, the triple zero host free hosting site, um, they're configured, I believe, out of the box to use PHP. So you can, you can use PHP with them. Or if you're a C++ fanatic, I think they'll even take um, some scripts at that level. All right. You guys are new to HTML and new to computer programming in general. But this is something to kind of let it forever be indelibly burned into your brains. Never, ever, ever, ever assume data coming from a form 
is valid or safe. Okay. Now there are reasons for that and we'll talk through some of those in a minute, but never assume that the data coming from a form is valid or safe. You have to validate it. You have to make sure that either you validate it with JavaScript, validate it with the HTML5 um, attributes for validation, or you validate it on the server side. If you don't validate, you're opening yourself up to be hacked. Because it'll happen. It's happened to me. It'll happen to you. You have to, you have to validate, okay? You have to validate it. All right, so on your server, validate the data. Make sure that the data that it is supposed to be is what you expect it to be, right? Whatever you're expecting it to be, it needs to be. You need to use the in input types that are um, designed for the purpose. So if it's simple text, use text for things like name, last name. If it's an email, use the email type. If it's a uh, telephone, use the telephone type. Always use the types, input types designed for the purpose, okay? So date, email, phone, they help you to control the data coming into your server. And of course, this is the big one. Check data for SQL injection. Have any of you all had the, um, the database class yet? You're in it right now? Okay. So, so let, me, let me give you an example. Let's say you're writing a select statement, right? So you say select last name, comma, first name from contacts table where, and then you specify last name equals uh, Stephen, or well, last name equals Benedicto. Right? That data that comes back from the query will give you that information, last name, first name, and last name in the order you gave it. Typically what we do as developers, we're using the HTML form and then we're processing it on the server side to send it to a SQL query. Now why is SQL injection something we need to worry about? Well, if you don't check your form Someone could type into the form something like this at the end of their, their statement where it's like first name and last name. Find, find this person, first name and last name. And they could put first name, last name, whatever, it, it doesn't matter. And then after it, say they would put a space where, or they could put um, A equals A. And that simple statement, A equals A, would hijack your query, pinned it to the end, and automatically now return everything where A equals A. Well, A equals A, by most databases, is interpreted as a non-data field, and it bypasses the query and returns all the data. There's a whole, uh, 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 there's a lot of sites you can actually read about for SQL injection to test your site for it, to actually test things for it. Um, just be aware, always check the data coming in that someone's not appending an extra SQL statement to the end of it, because if they do, they could hijack your data and return a lot of things. In the early days of banking, this was a big concern because people would go into these sites to log in and they would say on the last name field, they put in their last name and then say, and, and they would append some extra fields. And A equals A. And it would automatically bring back everybody's banking information instead of just the first person. That was a typical SQL injection. All right, enough said. Validate the data. Because whatever you, whatever someone types in, never assume that the data is safe. Always validate it. All right. <clears throat> We're going to switch a little bit now. Grouping your form elements. 
your field and data set elements. Uh, it's a good idea when you, when you create your forms that you try to group like elements together. Now think about this. Why would you do that? Well, if you want your users to feel like this is a friendly process and that they're going to enter the information that really matches the label, then it's, it's ideal to group the information in sections. So for example, you could group the top in a field set and call those, those data information sets personal information. Personal information may include things like first name, last name, right? Nickname. You would group another one, maybe say it is um, uh, date of birth or whatever. You group your data on the page so that it makes it easy for your customers to figure out how to how to use them. The other things you want to use are typically the legend element. So the legend element it will give you field set captions when you hover over. So you could put the legend element on certain items and it will give extra suggestions for what you need to do. Uh, as well just use the H1 and the H6 headings to label your groupings. All right, so take a look at this example that we have here. We have an H1, create a new account. We have the form, the method is a post, and the action is show data.php. We're wrapping account information in this field set, and these, this is where you'd put your account fields. Then we create another field set and we have an H2, this is address, and we wrap these address fields in that field set. And then we have a field set just for public profile. And the public profile includes things like your radio buttons, like gender, uh, male, female. Uh, you have a field set for controlling emails. Maybe they have multiple email fields you're going to use. And then the bottom one outside of all the field sets is the submit. So again, let me ask this question to the group, to the class, which, which is required for submitting an element, for submitting the form? Which three things are required? That's it. That was actually four things. Very good. Those four things are important. The name, again, this is the data name that the post or the get is going to convert into the key value pair sent off to the server. And the input type submit allows you to submit to send the data. If you don't have this on the page, um, they can enter all the fields, no problem, but there's no way to submit. So you want to make sure you have the submit type on the field. All right, I'm going to take a break here. Let's go ahead and open up um, Adam for a moment. And what I want you to do, we're going to go ahead and uh, create a new uh, site. Let's see. I'm going to create it in this folder, My Forms. Create a file, index.html. We'll put the HTML tag, hit enter. I'm going to, um, just going to leave it like that for right now. All right, so we're going to create a form. I'll hit enter. And this really makes it nice for us because it, it automatically fills out all the information for us. Uh, it has the post. I'm going to change it to a get for right now, and I'll demonstrate what happens when you submit something on the screen. We're going to have an input type called text. The name is going to be first underscore name. We're going to wrap the name in a label. 
and the label we're going to say is first dash name. I'll go ahead and put an ID down here. Oops. First dash name. And I'm going to take this label and just put it right around the input. Now, at this point, I've got a simple form set up. I'm going to go ahead and um, create a new window here. And I'm going to open up the file. This is in my NMC directory, my CSS, my websites, uh, my forms, index.html. We'll open it, and there's literally just that, right? nothing on the page. All right, so let's go back. Put this back up there. And I'll say first name. Save it. And refresh it. And now I have just a simple first name field. Okay. So let's go back down. We're going to wrap this in a field set. Copy that. Put it right there. Let's uh, beautify this real quick. And inside of this I'm going to put H1 personal information. Save it. Go back up here and refresh it. Notice that the field set automatically created this box around it. Okay, so we're going to go down, we're going to type another label, and this one is going to be last dash name, last name for the label value. The input is type text. We're going to create an ID on it. The ID is last dash name and the value is last underscore name. Okay, we refresh it a little bit. Now we have two elements. Um, we could organize it that way, but personally I like to um, I like to organize my elements stacked, so I'm going to put the first one in a, uh, a p-value paragraph and create a second one and put it in a paragraph and go down here and beautify this again. So refresh it. All right, so we've got it kind of lined up a little bit. Um, let's create a new field set. And inside this field set, we'll create a new H1. And this is going to be um, email address, or how about this? contact information. Save it, refresh it. We're going to see another field set with an H1 in it. So we'll create a paragraph tag and inside our paragraph tag we'll put uh, a label and my label is going to be for a 
uh, home address. And input so this is going to be the home underscore <coughs> home address excuse me it's not COVID <coughs> ah. all right home dash address okay do another paragraph do another label and this one is going to be um, zip code Input ID Okay, pretty straightforward so far, right? So I've got a name last name home address zip code um, pretty straightforward. So let's go down here now and input a um, a another a new input, and this one is going to be of type submit, and the value is going to be. Submit my info, information. All right, we don't need a name attribute on this one. Okay, so we refresh that. We have our submit button. Now, if I come in here and I type in some information, um, PO box one two 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 nine six nine five zero and I hit submit. Notice what happened up top. We're, remember we're using a get on this one and let me bring this down just a hair so you can see it. It took the the name, the data name and it put it all up here in um, name value pairs, right? So we have first name equals Michael ampersand. This is the part of the query string that changes it now. And the last name equals Rogers ampersand home underscore address. This is what is actually done in a get. So as you can see, if you use a get, it submits all of that data up here in the, um, in the query string. The other reason why we typically don't want to use a get to submit all of the information is the URL length itself, I believe it has like 250 characters is the max amount. I'm probably off on that. It's not a big amount though for in your query string. So you don't want to do all of your data in a query string. It's better to do it inside of a post. So if we take this and make it a post, refresh our screen. Well, take out all that data up there, hit enter. I'm going to inspect the page, go to network and because our action is submitting to index HTML. Uh, we should see some data actually come back up in here. So I'll click my information again that I typed in a minute ago. Click submit. And there we see it was submitted. We don't have the information up here. It was submitted 
in the background. Now if I click on this, there's the data. If I look at the response, that's what's happening. The headers, preview, so forth, right? Let's see, where is... Ah, here it is, the headers. When you look at the header, you'll see the data submitted in here. And this is, um, I'm trying to think the best way to describe this. When you submit using a post, there are several lines that are submitted in sequence. And in a post, the first line is going to usually be something about, uh, let's see, that's, that's the, so the, the way the form data is going to look like is this, right? This is the form data, but inside the, the post, it's going to have things like, um, the method type, it's going to have the accept, it's going to have all of this data that's submitted and then down at the bottom is going to be the form data that's submitted as well, right? This information is different. This is the request headers. This is different than it was if we submitted it via, um, via get, right? Because the get would put the information up here. All right, any questions so far? Okay, it's very common guys when you're going to submit data that the uh, security feature is turned on. Like you don't want to submit data to a site that, that, that is not secure, right? It needs to have a valid HTTPS uh, padlock up here. So that, that padlock is encrypting your data, sending it across the web to the other side, and it's unencrypting it, right? Okay, let's go ahead and jump back to our lesson real quick here. Let's see. All right, so we're looking at, let me go back. We're looking at organizing our form elements. We looked at um, the reasons behind it, validation, right? Um, typically you use a get when you're trying to use a query. You want to go get information. You're just sending a small package of data and then you want to bring that data back. Whereas when you're submitting larger packages of data, you either use a put or a post. All right. So let's, let's look at these examples over here. We have different ways of organizing the data. Pretty much this is exactly what we were doing a moment ago. We're wrapping things in field sets because it provides a more logically consistent grouping on the page. Now, this example also so shows a password field. It shows a select box or a drop-down box. Uh, it shows a file upload. Um, and of course we have other other fields like the text area and radio buttons. All right, so in this example, they're organizing, but now they're adding a little CSS to it. Let's go back to our sample again. And I'm gonna create a new folder called CSS and a new file master CSS and in my index HTML create a link take out that one backslash there since we're not on a server and let's format some of this so let's say our h1 actually let's do a body and our body is going to have a font family of uh, Tahoma for Dania, Ariel, Helvetica, Sans Serif. 
Whoops. Okay. Refresh this. All right. We're going to make our H1s have a um, background color of black and a four color of white. We'll put a padding on this of 10 px. Let's see, save it. There we go. All right. So now we have some styling that we've done. Let's do. Um, On our inputs, say font family is inherit. Okay, so it's going to follow the same font. Save that, refresh it again. Okay. Let's do something else here as well. Let's do um, the border. Let's put a, oops. Let's put a border radius on this of a uh, three pixel. Maybe four pixel. Okay. And we'll say border is one pixel. Gray, let's see, solid, gray. You see a little bit of the rounding there. Let's give it a uh, height of 25 pixels and border width. Uh, a border width. Width of 200. Okay. Right. So we're styling it a little bit. Let's go down to the where the input type equals submit say height is 25 pixels width is 100 pixels let's say the um, color is silver Silver? I don't know. Uh, it's not really not long enough, is it? Let's do 200. Okay. And then margin All sides of five pixels. Maybe do a padding internally of 
two pixels. It's not affecting it, let's see. Oh, I got the wrong color, don't I? Background color is silver. The color is gray. Let's see if that looks better. Yeah, a little bit better, but it's not dark enough, so let's go with black. Okay. So we have some some styling set up, right? Uh, there's other things that we could do here. Let's go back to our presentation here. So basic CSS, right? It helps a lot. Um, notice the field groupings that we're using. All of that helps to uh, to give it a little bit more refined look. Okay. Let's look at some more text boxes though. So we could do things like required. Area required is true. Now required is going to basically set the, the form validation. When you try to submit, it ain't gonna submit because unless you have it filled out. And by using the ARIA required set to true, we're also telling the, um, the uh, tech, the form readers, the, uh, <clears throat> the um, I forget what it's called, the text readers to know about that functionality as well. And then we also have some other things down here like email as a, as a type and a placeholder text. So let's go ahead and go back. We'll take a look at those examples. In our HTML, we have a home address. We have all of that. Let's do another P, P tag here. And inside of it, we'll put a label. And this is going to be for email. And we're going to have an input. And the type of this input is going to be email. And we're going to use a placeholder text. Your email.com. And the name is going to be email. So we'll save that. We'll come back over here and refresh it. And you can see that your email is in there. If I type something in, it um, takes it out. If I submit, notice what it says. Because I've set it as a type of email, the browser is automatically validating. It says, please include an at sign in the email address. All right. That's one validation technique. That's just by using the type email. The other things that you can do in here, for example, we could go on to the first name and we're just gonna type required. So we saved it, refreshed it. If I hit submit, it's now telling me, please fill out this field. So if I fill it out, I click submit, it's submitted. Let me go back. Let's, uh, let's put uh, required as well on our email. Refresh it, click submit. Okay, so I gotta fill it out. I click submit again. And it's telling me again that I have to fill it out. So I'll just do that and it submits. All right, so let's go back. Let me come over here. And we talked about this earlier. If I say no validate, 
Well, let's figure out what happens. Notice it submits right away. With no validate on the form, it allows it to go through. Okay. All right, let's go back to our slides again. So we have first name text, we have email, the placeholder, right? Those are good examples. Let's look at the next one. Um, so for your form element text boxes, we have the name. This is the data name. We've talked about that in great detail. We have the ID, which is the identifier on the web page. It's used a lot for CSS as well as the, the label attribute. The type of the input box, whether it's text, submit, email, date, whatever. Placeholder. Placeholder is the hint text on the page. We have required. Now, I only just wrote required, but you could write required equals required. Again, this is whether it's um, HTML focus. Uh, the autofocus, we haven't set that yet, or the max length, or the autocomplete. All right, let's go ahead and go back. So right now, we have this field, and if I was to say with 20, let's make it shorter just for our purposes, 10, and save it, what really has happened? Does first name, is first name limited by 10 now? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. It's not limited, right? That width right here is the old-fashioned way of controlling the length of the box. But now, see, Master CSS has set the width over here in a different, different way, right? So how do we control the width? Well, we do that by saying max length. And so now max length, if I put five characters, come over here and I'll refresh it. And let's say M-I-C-H-A-E. I can't type anymore because the max length has stopped it right there. Now think about why max length may be important. Well, those of you who are taking SQL, taking database class right now, you understand that your database field, you set a size length on your fields, right? So if you set a size on your field and you're passing information from your HTML to your database, you wanna make sure that the length of your field matches what's on your database, right? Uh, let's look at the other example. What was the other one? Well, the other one was auto uh, focus, right? I I, should, I talked about this earlier, but by the way, when I click last name, see how I click the, the label or first name? All I'm doing is clicking the label, and because I click the label, it automatically gives focus to that. Now here, email, it's not working. Why is it not working? Ah, uh, because I don't have an ID. So if I put an ID in here, and I refresh it, when I click on this label, it should put the cursor inside. And there it is. All right, so that, that brings focus to it. But the other way that you can bring focus is by saying that the field itself needs to have, uh, needs to be the area of focus. Let's say, that when this form comes up, say you're a gamer site and all you really care about is the email address. And so you want to help out your user and so you just say uh, autofocus right there on email. Well, notice what happens now when I refresh the page. It's now put the focus down there on the email address, right? Uh, the other one that we had was the autocomplete. Now, autocomplete is automatically turned on, but we can turn it off 
we can say autocomplete off. And if I type on this now, there's no autocomplete. But last name had autocomplete and it's still available. First name though, it's turned off. All right. Any questions so far? Any questions? Do you guys need to take a break and stand up, stretch your legs? If you need to, please, please do that because uh, I know it can be hard. I teach a class as well earlier in the day and it's right after lunch and all of my students are falling asleep. <laughs> okay. Let's see here. Let's go ahead and go back to our lecture again. We've talked about autofocus, max length, autocomplete, um, size, okay? And, um, and then of course we have text area tag. We haven't done the text area tags. So let's go ahead and take a look at the text area tag. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and create a new field set in my, whoops. Create a new H1. Please enter your comments. And we'll create a label for it. Comments. And comments. And let's see what else. Oh yeah, text area. Okay, text area, we're gonna give the name for this as comments, say the ID is comments. And then you have this section here called row and columns. This is a leftover from early on. One, one character is one column. And so by saying column of 80, I'm saying it's across 80 characters. If I say the rows of eight, I'm saying it's eight characters in height, okay? So if we save this and refresh, we can see that we have, well, if I was to count it out, I'm not gonna count it out, but this is 80 characters, okay? So that is the text area. Let's go back to our Yep. Okay. So remember input type text is single line text. Text area is going to be multi-line text. Okay? Multi-line All right, so form elements of labels, we've really gone over this quite a bit. A label is the text that describes the purpose for the form field. Label element has a special attribute of four. We've gone over that quite a bit. When the four has the same value as the form ID, the label field are, they're associated explicitly. And of course, this improves in usability and readability and accessibility. Uh, accessibility is important when you're considering those who are visually impaired. If a visitor interacts with a label, such as clicking out with the mouse, that field gains focus. And by the way, anytime we talk about the keyword focus, focus means when it concerns um, control fields or input fields, that concerns that the cursor is in the input field. Focus is gonna be one of those words that you, uh, keywords you hear used a lot for CSS uh, pseudo classes, okay? All right, so multi-words, uh, this is again naming conventions. So we have first dash name, always multi-words always have dashes between them. The data attributes always use underscores. Okay, we're all pretty, pretty familiar with that. 
Guys, do you have any questions at this point? Does everyone understand so far? I haven't lost anyone, right? Okay. So <clears throat> let's talk real quick again about placeholder versus the attribute value. Um, placeholder text, again, this is just a hint for what the user is to, to enter. It's not synonymous. It doesn't equal the value. Uh, the value is the text entered that is sent onto the server. So if we look at our example, we have a placeholder text here on our email, but notice that the value is left empty. The value is what I type right here. Okay. And if I inspect what's typed, the value is still empty on the inspection. It's when I submit that that information is passed onto the, the server. There we go. Now it's, it should go. And if we look at the network, the data, you can see your data again that's submitted. All right. All right, so the other one is passwords. Everyone's familiar with passwords. Typically, you want to uh, do like what you see here on this example. You have the password, and then you want them to re-enter it again for the duplication. Uh, passwords, typically in all browsers now, they give you the option to press the, uh, the little icon, eye icon to display the text so you can see it. But on submission, these are, these are encrypted. They're kept secret from you. Uh, the typical way you use the input password is just you type input type password and off you go. Uh, we'll go ahead and demonstrate it real quick. So we have so far all this information in our content comments. We'll come down here. We'll enter another field set. Inside our field set, we'll have another H1. Please enter your new password and I'm going to use a ptext label password one and another Okay, input, we'll change the type to password. And this one is going to be password underscore one. And our ID, password one. And very simple, refresh it. There's our password, we type it in and it's, it's hidden, right? Uh, if we go ahead and do the submit, let me just type in some information here. We'll look at the index. You can actually see that there's your password that was typed in. All right. Let's go back again. So other input types. We have email, which, we, which we've been using. We have URL and we have telephone. And we have this interesting little bit of text down here. Does anyone know what this is called? It's right here in the attribute. Does anyone want to make a guess for what this might be called? It is the way you input a phone number because the D stands for digit. And then it's three characters in length separated by a dash with another D 
for digit, three characters in length separated by a dash, D for digit, and then four characters in length. But this sequence of text has a particular type of name in software development. Does anyone know? Okay, I'll give you a hint. It, it, I'll give you the, uh, the initials, R-E. <laughs> no one has any idea, do you? Regular expression, regular expression. And regular expression, there is a lot that you can do for this. Um, regular expression is, it's shorthand for regex, or the shortened version is regex. And it refers to a sequence of characters that define the search pattern. Um, I use a VI editor or Vim quite a bit when I'm working on Linux boxes. And sometimes when I'm having to search across the big file, I'll use a regular expression to search through that file and find a piece of text, as well as I can use it to replace text all throughout the entire a document on the fly very fast. Um, what I'm going to give you here is a link. This is a great site for you to go to. I'm going to paste this in the chat. Uh, please go ahead and take the opportunity to go to that site now uh, while I'm kind of talking through this. So re regular expressions, they allow you to find and replace certain things. Um, Every language, is every language uses them. Um, languages like C++, Java, Python, uh, they're available in PHP, even in HTML, and CSS, and JavaScript, and so forth. Um, here, for example, is a regular expression that validates for an email address. Can anyone see or make out how this would work? So the first set of sequences says it'll take any set of characters between A and Z, lowercase, and any set of characters, uppercase, between A and Z, and any set of numbers between 0 and 9, right? And it'll also take dashes and dots. And this, you're going to take this, uh, we have the carrot in front, which means this is where it begins, and then it's looking for an exact match of an at symbol, right? It must find that. And then following that, it could be, again, any same set of characters followed by a dot. The dot would have to be there. And then another set of A, lowercase A's or uppercase A through Z or A through Z again, right? So this is a fairly uh, obvious regular expression for emails. Um, I'd like to see you guys go ahead and do some research, though, for me and find other regular expression that exists for emails because this is actually a very popular use case scenario for regular expression, finding out how to validate if an email is correct or not. I'll go ahead and paste this in the chat as well so you guys can use it for later. But there are many sites out there on the web that have regular expressions that you can write. Okay, um, This site breaks down regular expressions. Um, I don't know how much of this is going to be on the exam, but um, this is good information for you guys to at least take a look at and become familiar with. Uh, the syntax, how it works, and, and what you can use it for. Uh, backslash S is always going to match white space. Uppercase S matches non-white space characters. Non-white space characters. So sometimes there are spaces and they're not a white space character. There may be like a tab. Maybe they're a, um, a new line character. Uh, any number of hidden characters on a text. D's always match it, 
match digits, capital D matches non-digit characters. W's are for words. So it'll look at a piece of text and it, it recognizes the space, the limitation. And so it'll match a, a word for you. Uh, capital W's are non-words and B's match boundaries. So spaces, dashes, semicolons, and so forth. Um, again, take the time to look through that. Okay, so I brought up regular expression, but why would I bring it up? Well, <clears throat> it's very important to use um, for things like email, phone numbers, and so forth. So here is a pattern that is used for an email. So I'm gonna take the pattern that we had over here, I just pasted it in the chat, and I'm gonna open up Adam. I'm gonna come down to, where's my email at? I'm gonna say, oops, pattern equals quotes, paste in the regular expression, And we'll come over here and we'll refresh and let's test it out. Let's see if it'll let me write an email that doesn't match the pattern. Now I have one down here at the bottom. Let's see if it works. Let's see, I have to enter something up there. And if I size this a little bit better, There we go. I hit submit. Well, it took that, didn't it? Oh, there we go, pattern. <laughs> I didn't fill out my attribute correctly. So let's, let's do it again. Submit. Did I refresh? Save it, refresh, okay. Let's try that again, because it shouldn't have taken. Okay, so you gotta fill that out. There we go. It doesn't match the format. Why? Because there's not a dot at the end of it that tells us, right? Uh, and similarly, if I was to take a valid email, say like, uh, that one and put, let's see, just a Q. I don't know if that would, that would work or not. Let's see. Nope. Doesn't match the format because I imagine it has to have more than one letter. Oh, there's something it doesn't like about that. We might want to check our regex here. But in general, that's how regex, that's how it works. All right. Um, take the time and look at those. Look at your regular expressions. Um, you can also go to W3Schools. They have uh, sample regex patterns. You can go to uh, Mozilla and look at basic validation for these. There's a lot and a lot of uh, lots and lots of different regular expression patterns you can use. All right, so the next type we have here is the radio button. Can anyone guess where the radio button came from originally? Does anyone know why it's called a radio button? because you guys don't listen to the radio. <laughs> Martin, you just looked up like, oh, come on, mister. <laughs> oh, do you? All right, look at the top of your buttons there. What happens when you press one and then you press a different one? But does one button stay stuck or does it come undone? And then when you press it. <laughs> okay. All right. Believe it or not, right, I'm aging myself. 
uh, in your in your car in the old days there was this manual button okay and these little manual buttons and you push them in and it would change the radio frequency to that radio station and then if you press in a different button the other button would pop out and that would change the frequency to a different one the way radio buttons work it means that only one radio at a one radio button at a time may be selected uh, i was hoping someone was layla do, do you remember those old radio buttons i'm i'm all alone here i'm all alone okay this is where it comes from by the way I'm dating myself very much. So in this example, we have the input type radio. We have the ID name is gender male and the name is gender. Now there's the other thing I want you to notice about radio buttons is that the name attribute must be identical for the radio buttons. The name attribute must be identical. The reason for this is, is that because only one value can be chosen, the value that is selected will be transmitted. The other interesting thing here is that you have to specify the value that will be passed on. So the typical example is male or female, but it could be other examples. It could be, please select only one of the following. And it may be like uh, those YouTube videos, help us with these ads by selecting one of the following right the value is predetermined and when you select it it's going to pass the name all right let's go ahead and demonstrate it um, I'm going to because of space limitations here I'm going to take out my password field set and the text area field set I'm going to change inside of here and put a new P tag and we'll have a label whoops and the label is going to be for um, let's see here <clears throat> Okay, and then the radio, the value will have to be gender, and here we'll specify the value for us as male. And then we'll do a second one, input type radio the name will be gender it has to be exactly the same and the value will be female now we'll go ahead and save that and refresh and you can see that here is oh let's see I'm missing here Give me a second, guys. Okay. Let's see here. Let's change this. Or I think we have to wrap these is the way I remember doing this like that and this one is going to be label again for female And we have to give the IDs. OK. 
Okay, we'll refresh that. Now that makes a little bit better sense. So if you click on the labels, it's going to select either the appropriate one. Now, when you submit this, let's, let me go back here. My pattern is not right, so we don't want to put this on. We submit this and we look at what is submitted. Refresh it. You'll notice that the form value submitted for gender is male. If I change it and submit and look at the form value, now the form value is female, but the data attribute never changes. This is the important part of your of your options or your form uh, radio buttons. Okay, going back to your group here, we're kind of running short on time, so let's see if we can push through this. Uh, the next set is your checkbox. Uh, checkbox, again, notice that the name is going to be identical. So the name of your data attributes, these are going to be identical, but checkboxes allow you to check one or more. They don't have to necessarily be not checked. The values for these, uh, the values are going to be uh, distinct for each checkbox, but the name between the checkboxes will be identical. And you can see in this instance, we set the label for this on the back side of the checkbox, because that's typically how most of these are set up. All right. Let's go and jump forward again. We've already talked about text area. Um, one of the key things, though, to remember for text area is that you can input up to 32,700 characters in a text area, unless you set the max length. So again, evaluate, work with your, uh, your, data, your database administrator, or if you're creating the field in the, data, in the database, make sure that the value of your text area will not exceed the value of your table, your table field, okay? Uh, select areas. So select areas give us this nice little drop down feature. Uh, again, it's just like radio values. You can only select one unless you set the value as multiple. If you set it as multiple, then you can actually have more than one value selected. And when you send it as data through your form, it'll actually show up on the form data as a comma delimited list of those selections. Okay, uh, so the format for this is pretty straightforward. We'll go ahead and take out our label here for radio buttons and I'll create a new label and this is going to be for uh, states. And we'll have a select. We'll specify the name. And then we'll have our options. So we'll have an option. We'll call the first one uh, Mariana's Pacific. We'll have another option. We'll have this one as Kentucky. We'll have another option. And we'll have that one as California. We'll save it, refresh. And of course, now you see that there's the, the different options that are available. If I select for this one, you can see that the value submitted in the states is MP. Now, uh, I just showed a minute ago that you can also change these to multiple. Um, so we can set like that, save it and refresh. And now it's changed the list into more of like a data list and I can select multiple items, submit it. We'll look at the form data again and you can see there's states, Kentucky, and states, California. 
if I select the top and the bottom, submit it, look at the form data, states MP and states KY. If we look at the, um, the source, you'll notice that here is states MP, ampersand states CA. I told you earlier it was common to limited, that, that's my bad. Uh, it actually is ampersand delimited there. All right, so that is the select. Let's go ahead and look again at our slides. Uh, we also have option groups. So you can specify an option label within your groups. Um, the typical way you do that, we could have right here, we could say option group, and we'll create the label and say US territory. I'm going to cut this section and paste it there. And if we save it and refresh it, you'll see that now the option group label has separated it, right? A very easy, very quick way to include your, your option groups and your data list. Okay. Uh, then we have also um, for your multi-select, you can specify the size. Um, size affects how many lines are revealed. So depending on how many pieces of text, maybe you want it to display 10 lines or three lines or two lines. It, it all depends on what your user preference is or what you're trying to accomplish. Any questions so far? No? Okay. Um, the other ones we have here are the form submits. So in the form submit, the way we have to do this is you have to modify the attribute and put an insight type multi-part form data. And in your input type, you'll use file. So let's go ahead and run the example real quick. I'm going to take out my select area here and I'm going to use an input, change the type to file. And this is going to be images. We'll come up here. We'll change this to insight type. And we'll use multi-part form data. The reason for that is you're, you're submitting text and form data together. So you have to make sure you have that selected. Otherwise, it won't, it won't submit a value. Uh, let's look at our example real quick in the slide one more time. So we have the name, we have the input type. Okay, so let's go ahead and refresh our, well, let's save it first. Come over here and click on this and you see it gives us a file type to choose from. Um, I'm gonna go up to my website and pick an image and there's a fave icon, that's a good one. We did that a while back. I've selected it. And if I submit the update, we look over here in the headers and you can see that, well, it's not gonna show it to you, but the, um, the value is gonna be encoded in the submission. So that, that allows you to do your uh, file type uploads. And of course you can specify file types as well. You can, you can specify that they'll only be PDFs. You can specify any type of, uh, scenario. All right. Next thing we have on the list is really our hidden file types. These are very important many times when the form that's being loaded is going to be pre-populated with a data from your server. So the data could be something like a pre-identified ID number that maybe your server is going to give to the user to protect uh, from multiple, um, um, to protect from multiple users overriding and re receiving data at the same time. Uh, it could be a scenario like we have here where 
Uh, you've already submitted like in a wizard type fashion, the data to the database. And so the next form is going to use the email as a hidden input type and it would be listed in the form. The thing to remember about your hidden input types is that are not visible on the page at all. If we look at that as an example, and I could just type this uh, right in here, I could say input hidden, and the name could be maybe first name, share the same value as the one up above and this value is going to be hidden so if I say Michael I save it and I refresh you can't see it it's not there unless you inspect the DOM for it and if you inspect the DOM you're gonna see right in here here's the hidden file and the value. Hidden files are very useful when you're trying to pass data that maybe it's already been submitted. Again, do not submit uh, PII, social security numbers, other things like that in your hidden files. You don't want to use those. Store that data in the database and use a representative value like an ID or something else. Okay. Uh, you can as well, you can disable fields. Disabling fields is pretty much just putting disabled on it, or you could say read only. Um, both of these will apply to all form elements. Very easy to use. You don't have to type disabled equals. You could just say disabled, and it makes the form disabled. So in this instance over here, uh, if I make the zip code disabled, and I make the email read only. I save those and refresh. Zip code now is not clickable and email is clickable, it's selectable, but you can't enter any data. Okay. All right. And then we get down to the submit button. So earlier, the way we created the button was an input type submit, but alternatively, alternatively, I'm sorry, is someone talking? Okay, alternatively, you can use the button type submit, and this will do the same thing. Typically, you wanna use some type, wrap the button type in an image and, um, with the label and it'll create your button that way. Uh, the reset button. Reset will change all of the form elements back to default. So if you have a reset on the page, you click that, it will cause all of the elements to be reset. So in our example over here, we have a submit. We could type input reset and we could just say cancel. Refresh the page, you're gonna see the cancel button. So if I type in some information, I click cancel, it just resets the form. All right. Um, you can also use turn off uh, validation on the input or the reset by saying form no validate. Um, this is important if you have validation set, you want to put these on there, especially in the reset, because you don't want to have your, um, if you have a, a field that has required on it, you want to make sure you put uh, the form no validate on the reset button. Okay, I mentioned this earlier, and we're going to call it quits right here, but I want to look at this as one last item. These are the different ways you can style the inputs. Remember, focus talks about whether the element is has focus, meaning the cursor is flashing on the element. Checked refers to radio boxes and, and check, check boxes. Disabled means that you can style a field that's disabled a different way. Enabled is the opposite of disabled, so uh, you can style all of your inputs with the ampersand, 
with the colon enabled that way. Uh, required, optional, invalid, and so forth. Many times when you're styling your fields, you want to cause all of your required fields to have like an asterisk or something to highlight them to say that these are required that people need to pay attention to. Um, so these are your, uh, your pseudo elements that you can use in, H in CSS to style these. And then of course, examples of how you could use it, input colon focus, text area focus, and so forth. Same thing for required text, we're putting the um, different ways to deal with it.